Hello and welcome to our first video lesson on Chapter 6, How Enzymes Work. In this lesson we'll be looking at the general role of enzymes as catalysts and see why they are so necessary in living systems. Let's first review the fact that a peptide bond forms by the combination of a carboxyl group of one amino acid and the amine group of a second amino acid, thereby excluding water. In other words, it's a condensation reaction. And so if we want to break that bond, we do so by adding water. That's hydrolysis, that is lysis, by adding water. And that's illustrated at the bottom of our slide here. We'll add the oxygen to the carbonyl carbon to form the carboxyl group on one end, and we add the two hydrogen atoms to the nitrogen to form the amine group on the other end. The half-life of peptide bonds in vitro that is outside the cell is about 20 years. So if I had a test tube of protein, after 20 years, half of those peptide bonds would still be intact. Clearly, a very strong, very stable bond. And that's comforting since most of the structures and much of the activity in the cell relates to this very strong bond. But there is a problem. What if I want to recycle? And as it turns out, part of the normal function of a cell is to recycle its components. That includes proteins and therefore peptide bonds. How can we make this chemical reaction happen more readily? Well, we know from chemistry that we can increase the rate of a reaction by elevating the temperature. However, as living organisms, we can only tolerate a small fluctuation in temperature. And so that is not an option. We know from Le Chatelier's principle that if we increase the concentration of the reactants, we can thereby elevate the concentration of the products. But this also is not feasible in a living cell because it doesn't always control the availability of reactants or biological molecules. Our third option, and the one that really is the only feasible option, is to add a catalyst. Remember the definition for catalyst. It speeds up a reaction, but is not consumed in the process. And so we have enzymes as biological catalysts. The term enzyme comes from the Greek meaning in yeast. It was first used with reference to fermentation in yeast, and that's the etymology of the name. It was the first recognition that it wasn't the cell itself, but something smaller inside the cell that was responsible for the reaction. Enzymes are true catalysts, that is, they're not permanently altered or consumed. As we'll see, they may be modified in the course of the reaction. However, at the end of the reaction cycle, they must return to the original form. Most enzymes are protein, though we'll see that some are made of RNA. So the next question is, how well do they work? Well, they can speed up reactions to a rather amazing degree. Here is a table from your book representing the rate enhancement of enzymes. The first column is the name of the enzyme. The second column is the half time. The third column is the rate of the uncatalyzed reaction, that is how many times it happens per second. The next column is the catalyzed rate, how fast it happens with the aid of the enzyme. And then the last column is the rate enhancement, the catalyzed rate divided by the uncatalyzed rate. How how much faster did the reaction go? Let's look at one example. Let's look at carbonic anhydrase. Remember, this is the enzyme responsible for maintaining the equilibrium between carbon dioxide and bicarbonate, our very important buffering system in the blood. Let's look at this as an example. So we see that the uncatalyzed rate is 0.13 per second. In other words, several seconds would have to pass before the reaction occurred. However, in the presence of the enzyme, the catalyzed rate is 1 million times per second. Yes, that's right. The chemical reaction occurs 1 million times in 1 second. That represents a rate enhancement of a trillion fold. Truly amazing degree of rate enhancement. Not all enzymes work this fast, but you can see with all of the chemical reactions that need to occur in a living cell, without enzymes, we couldn't carry out those reactions on a time scale that would make life possible. 
So in other words, without enzymes, life would not be possible as we know it. Clearly a very strong need. The next thing to recognize is that each enzyme has an active site where catalysis takes place. In other words, this is where the chemistry occurs. Most often they're in crevices on the enzyme surface, though sometimes it could be at a subunit interface if we're talking about a multi-subunit complex. Let's look at the example of chymotrypsin and the gray ribbon diagram on the bottom left. This is the first enzyme that we'll look at in detail. The active site residues are highlighted in red and you can see it is in a, a crevice or buried portion of the protein. Sometimes there is a pocket to which the substrate binds and then the enzyme closes around the substrate. A good example of that is hexokinase on the bottom right here. The space filling model in blue is hexokinase, the red is its substrate glucose. As you can see there's a binding pocket for glucose, but then there's a conformational change in the enzyme after it binds substrate. This gives it a protected environment. We'll look at this more particularly later. We we'll often find with enzymes that catalysis occurs in a protected environment, and this is so that there is nothing to interfere with the proper completion of the reaction cycle. Let's look at how these biological catalysts differ from metal catalysts. First of all, they have very complex, very specific structures. And as we just saw, catalysis may be associated with conformational changes. They also work under mild conditions with regard to temperature and pressure. For metal catalysts, they often require elevated temperature or pressure or both. They also differ from metal catalysts in that they only act on a specific substance called the substrate. Some are so specific that they will act on the L enantiomer but not the D. Others may be a little bit more promiscuous or forgiving with regard to the substrates that they bind. And we can actually use this to our advantage. It can be important for detecting and measuring enzyme activity. Remember the table we saw in the earlier slide? where we measured how much product was formed per unit time. We do that by measuring enzyme activity. This is the measure of enzyme activity. Let's look at the example of chymotrypsin. Its normal function is to hydrolyze a peptide bond. It adds water across a peptide or amide bond. However, it can use the substrate paranitrophenyl acetate pictured here and it will hydrolyze the bond connecting the acetate to the nitrophenol part of the molecule. So clearly not a peptide bond and yet similar enough that chymotrypsin will work on this substrate. Our product then is paranitrophenolate which is yellow in color and we can detect that by its absorbance at a wavelength of 410 nanometers. So the substrate is colorless, the product is colored, and we can measure the strength of the color as indicating the concentration of product. So again, we can measure how much product forms within a given period of time. And this is how those measurements were arrived at with regard to how much product per unit time in the table that we saw in the earlier slide. In our next video lesson, we want to look at how we can classify enzymes by the tap type of reactions they catalyze, and we'll look briefly at how enzymes are named.